This is with Amber. This is Summer Gypsy. My name is Ezekiel Chaos. Sparkly Pancakes. Healer Swift. I play top. And I play jungle these days. I like to support a team up. I fight for Demacia. Oh yeah, we're playing LOL. I was like, what's LOL? It's like, laugh out loud. I was like, no, fool. That's League of Legends. Holy crud, did this suck us in and get us connected? We're raging at each other. We're, we're <laughs> aging, we're, we're laughing. League is something that is not as much as a game, but more of a place where we can be ourselves and enjoy what we do and who we do it with. You guys ready? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cue it. Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. All right, we're queuing up. GLHF, everybody. There's always been that parent to child stigma of whatever you don't understand is obviously not valuable. A lot of parents or society saw people as being antisocial. Hey, this kid is holed up in his room playing games, then it's totally ruining society. I don't think gaming is as niche and isolated as a lot of people think it is. There are these really strong human stories. He started playing and I found out he liked me. We've only known each other about a year. Give or take. Give or take and we're just like brothers, so. The game is all done through word of mouth. 85% of people who come to League of Legends is through a friend. Legend has over 100 million players actively playing every month. That's over 1% of people on Earth. The nerds are coming together. We, we will dominate this world. Competition and player versus player engagement is old as video games have been around. We don't get that competitive. No. Not a single one of us is competitive, I swear. It's a giant guerrilla warfare scenario, and only the smartest, strongest, and best players come out alive. The finals drew in 36 million. That's more than the Stanley Cup Finals, the World Series, and the NBA Finals combined. I've been playing games my whole life. I started playing PC games when I was about seven years old. And I thought it was like a magic puzzle. It just felt like a whole new world opening up because I had a huge passion for games like Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games in general. The most powerful game experience that I ever had, even to this day, was in a text-based multi-user game called Dragon Realms. You could sort of boot up the computer, log in, and be surrounded by hundreds or thousands of people from all around the world simultaneously logged in, living out adventures in a world with seemingly limitless possibilities. My parents were pretty anti-game. They were big on academics and sports, so we had pretty strict rules in the house. For me, it was a bit of an escape. I wasn't the best student, and when I was really into games, it became a huge source of conflict and clashing. Let's take a look at League of Legends. It is one of the most popular video games out there. It is raking in billions in revenue. Riot Games is the company behind it. And today, the company is front and center on the cover of Inc. Magazine. Joining us now for a CNBC Power Lunch exclusive are Riot Games co-founders Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill. Brandon and Mark, welcome. Good to have you uh, both here. I think one of the great delicious ironies here, and either one of you can pick up on this, is that neither of your parents were all that thrilled at the amount of time you spent uh, gaming as, as young guys. What do, you, what do they say now? Yeah. How do you like me now? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, actually, my first Nintendo was something that I won uh, at my first grade school raffle because my parents are so anti-video games. And so, you know, we sort of think about it. It was fate. Couldn't keep us away. Mark and I met in a summer program right before college. And I was younger than him, so I was one of the young kids in the program. I was like 16. I think he was 
17 or 18, he was about to go to USC. And I'm like, oh, you're from LA. Oh, cool, no, me too. And oh, you like video games? And we instantly sort of hit it off. Mark had this dichotomy of like an Eagle Scout who was captain of the football team and crushing it in school and like tabletop D&D nerd. Brandon was a business major and he was sort of the consummate business guy. You know, even from a really young age, he was just really thoughtful about opportunities. Mark and I were playing tons and tons of games. We are playing the heck out of Counter-Strike and StarCraft and, you know, and World of Warcraft at the time were sort of our main games. But ultimately, our favorite game at the time was Dota. Dota was a custom mod for Warcraft 3. When Blizzard shipped Warcraft 3, they shipped it with a map editor, and people would use the map editor to make different scenarios that you could play on. It really pioneered a new subgenre of real-time strategy games by focusing on one particular unit that was really, really powerful and really interesting, and then working with a team of other people. Five players was really a lot of coordination. That was really fun and exciting. But it loaded really slow. And there was a strong lack of matchmaking, so you could be playing with someone who is 10 times better than you were. You had to kind of beat your head against the wall at every step, from hearing about the game, to getting the installation done, to downloading the map, to getting into the game for the first time. Even though it left a lot to be desired from a service standpoint, Dota demonstrated that games as a service was something that could work. We felt like a lot of game companies weren't really focused on gamers like us. We don't want to buy a box, play a game, and be done 30 hours later. If the online multiplayer arena of the game was compelling enough, we want to spend hundreds of hours in it, thousands of hours in it. We wanted to compete as part of a community over and over again. We then started to ask ourselves, what does the game company of the future look like? And how could we potentially build that? We spent nine months putting together a plan, trying to talk ourselves out of it, really. We wanted to build a company that unapologetically embraced the hardcore gamers that might be considered niche or a small slice of the audience. We had a feeling that this isn't a particularly small niche and there's a lot of us and there's a lot of pain points that we could solve as a company that really cared about that type of player experience. So Mark and I pulled the trigger and we started Riot Games in 2006 in West Los Angeles. Yeah, it's like the gaming company version of like the Mighty Ducks. We were in this tiny office with a stained floor and we had one conference room and the ceiling leaked. I guess from the investor perspective, it would have been described as a capital efficient, which, you know, but I think that in the common vernacular, that means shitty. We essentially had some really passionate, really smart, really inexperienced interns and a couple of industry vets who hadn't had a lot of career success. We had to learn everything we didn't know and do it with a very young team. And we were really nervous because it was months before we had a big demo and key milestone for the company. Mark and Brandon demoed the game to me on the street in San Francisco. He put the laptop on a newsstand. And we proceed to play this really crude tech demo, like the gameplay. And I saw the game and I just thought, oh God, what have I gotten myself into? That map is awful. It's like, the, it was so terrible, so cheesy looking. It was clunky, the interface was really bad, the art was really bad. But they'd managed to do more in three months than some of these other companies that were paying stupid sums of money. And I was just like, wow, this is actually pretty compelling. It was so ambitious. The amount of software that they wanted to write was crazy. We built matchmaking, we built your inventory, champ select. We were building everything outside of the game. The engine was an absolute mess. It barely ran. You know, you can't expect that much of a company that's never shipped a game with a president and CEO that have never shipped a game. There was a lot of pressure. We have one shot at this. The real problem to solve is you have to make a game that's fun, that all these people that love Dota and love Warcraft and love strategy and love hardcore games are going to want to play. The game was about characters. We basically scoured pop culture 
and built mood boards of awesome art and things that captured powerful archetypes from history and from folk tales and from fables. We took the ones that we thought were the most compelling and kind of added our kind of pop fantasy spin to them to bring them to life and to show a face of them that players had never seen before. They'll be tattooed and badass and they're kind of renegades. And so we need to make 40 champions in a year and a half and make sure that we covered a wide cast so that any player that came in could say like, that one looks awesome, I want to play that one, and they'd have a good time. That was the goal. Welcome to Summoner's Rift. League of Legends is a five-on-five -five game that's played across 20 to 45 minutes. In it, you cooperate with your team of four other players to try to storm the base of your opponents and destroy it before they storm your base and destroy you. One of the closest sports analogies for League of Legends is basketball. There's a map in League of Legends called Summoner's Rift and that map is the same every single time, much like a basketball court. As far as the gameplay elements go, you get to pick what type of thing you want to be going in. In basketball, you have point guards, centers, power forwards, forwards, shooting guards. At this point, League of Legends has 137 different things on the roster. So the amount of different things you can play as is really big. You're in this fantastic magical world and you need to divide and conquer. What draws players in and drives that process of mastery is the fact that you are so connected to that character that a tiny, tiny mistake can result in a massive defeat or a huge victory. Once you kill the other team's base, which is called the Nexus, you win. I remember the first time we wanted to show anyone outside the company League of Legends, and we weren't sure if it sucked or not. When you're building a community, you really have to start with the individuals. And so I think day one was, let's start establishing personal relationships with the 200 people that are gonna be the first people who get into this thing. Riot Games is here at PAX really to interact with the community one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we have a huge focus on the community as a company. And so we love talking to the users, having them you know, sit down, play the game, getting their feedback live, and really trying to uh, also promote the game and expose a lot of people who have never heard of the kind of MOBA genre or multiplayer online battle arena genre, which League of Legends has really helped to pioneer. It handles a lot like Dota coming from years of Dota experience. This looks like it's actually not going to be just a mini game, you know? It's an actual, like, solid game, you know? I was not expecting to enjoy it this much. I'm, I'm generally not very good at multiplayer games, and there's something like a three-hour wait to get in a game right now. Oh, no, Shiver, an ally of Tarek here on the blue team, just got killed. And now Morgana is up there all by herself. She could get sniped herself if she's not careful. The Frost Phoenix is up there. It could slow her down and kill her. Yeah, I got my beta key. I already downloaded it last night. I played it last night, too. <laughs> so you can't get to enough. Go. Yeah, man. We had gone three years without making any revenue, just spending other people's money. Then we had the audacity to not sell our game and to make it available for free. Free games had a huge stigma in the late 2000s because the only games that were available that were free were really old games from Asia. MapleStory was the first free-to-play game in North America. When I first brought MapleStory out here, a lot of the business was going towards console. So I kind of went on a path to being an evangelist for online gaming and for free-to-play because not only was online gaming very strange, free-to-play was extremely strange and the PC supposedly as a platform was dying. Traditionally, people buy stuff, but the one thing that free-to-play really addresses is that it's free to play. So a lot of kids would start playing these games because there wasn't a hurdle for them to play, but free-to-play kind of has this reputation of being a little bit scammy and tricking you to do these things, or there's gonna be another player that buys power who's gonna basically overpower you with their wallet. Then, out of nowhere came Riot Games, and they used free-to-play kind of in the right way. I'll never forget this. 
We're in this meeting and we're talking about Annie, how she's all built with fire, and we're talking about blue Annie, and she would use frost. Maybe frost Annie would have like a slower attack rate, but a little bit more damage rate, and we'd sell that. You see Steve Feek kind of sitting there a little down about it, and Brandon says, Steve, you haven't said anything, what do you think? Steve looks up and he's like, I don't like it, but I'm having a hard time saying why. And Brandon says, does it, does it feel bad? And Steve's like, yeah, it just feels bad. So we decided early on that we wouldn't sell power. We didn't want the person with the most money to win the game. People said, oh man, we're giving up assuredly making $100 million on this game in order to try this experiment where we don't know how much we'll make. There are ways that people do spend money and they engage deeper with our content. We offer a series of champions on a free rotation, so several of them will be free. Those champions rotate every couple of weeks. Some players use the free champions as part of their repertoire in a game. For others, they'll buy the ones that they like the most. And they will spend our in-game digital currency called Riot Points. One of the other big items that we sell in the game are skins. Skins are a uniform. Because the game is free, because people get so much value out of it, our players are like, yeah, I'll pay for that skin. It's kind of a silly idea, but I'm more than happy to pay for an outfit. I'll spend my five, ten dollars, whatever, because I had a thousand hours of fun in this game. About a week before we got to the launch date, people came into the game and tried out the store, and the store immediately fell over. Literally, we get 500 people in as we're scaling up to a couple thousand in a scale test, store falls over. We're sitting there and watching this, the public chat channel, and one guy had gotten through the store and, and had bought Chogoth. And he was like, no worries, guys. I got my man Cho. It's all good. <laughs> it was like one guy out of like 5,000 or something. And I was like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. There was no store in the game. There was no way to make money. We would be paying all the infrastructure costs and having all the players in the game, but without a way for them to unlock any content. And so that was when we decided, let's think through this as players. If we were a player, what would we want to happen to us? And so as gamers, we decided, let's make everything free. We called it a launch party, like, hey, we've launched. But in the background, you had like half the company trying to build a store. And after locking ourselves in a room for you know 110 hours a week for about six weeks, uh, we ended up shipping the store. We brought the system down November 18th, and we brought it back up November 19th. Right sure, here is Riot Games history. But we're like staring at the screen, and it's blank for like two minutes. And then lo and behold, this little blip shows up for five bucks. So we were like, it works, it works, it totally works. And that was the launch of League of Legends. League was not an instant success. It wasn't like we launched the game and then suddenly our numbers went through the roof. It was marginally bigger than the day before, and the next day was just marginally bigger than the prior day. Tell you the truth, when I first saw this game, I thought it was lame, I thought it was boring. I looked at the game and it didn't really appeal to me. After the three hour download and patching, we got onto League and he's like, dude, just play it, and I begrudgingly agreed. There's kind of the saying in game dev that the game developers are the best at the games until about a week after it gets released to the players. Once you reach just so many people, they quickly are the ones that discover all the things that you never knew were there. When I first started playing the game, a lot of people thought the company was a dumpster fire. You log on Tuesday afternoon, can't play, servers are down, the store's down again, I crashed out again, oh, the client's full of bugs. It was certainly stressful. People were running around with their hair on fire a lot of the time as we were attempting to sort of keep, keep the wheels on the car. Anytime anything went wrong, it was like, oh my god, fix this shit right now. We can't lose this momentum. It was a problem where the servers were overloaded, but no one would log off. There was this real sense of blink and you'll miss it. So it was sort of the players fighting the game as much as each other. 
Things slowly started to stabilize in North America. They were way worse in Europe. European fans were furious. In Europe, we weren't really growing. The reason was because we were publishing League of Legends through a partner that had misaligned interests and, and weren't trying to operate the game in the same way and really care about players. And that culminated in one particular weekend where on a Friday, the service went down at like 11.45, 11.50, local time in France, and we actually can't get anyone that will restart the servers until Monday morning. It looks fine on the screen, guys, but trust me, it's not. I'm clicking like a maniac and it's not working for me. Attack, dude, attack that one. Oh my goodness gracious me. I get on the forums for the European players and just start to see people complaining. People are just scrambling and upset. And from the player perspective, Riot doesn't care. The players don't care about the nuances between partners and other stuff. Someone's gotta be there. Like, hey guys, I know this is bad, but I'm here. And every 15, 20 minutes, like, here's an update, here's an update, here's an update. And when that doesn't happen, the imagination runs wild, people start to make up stuff, and it just goes south really fast. When you're looking at that kind of data, you realize that that fundamental belief that players are human beings that deserve to be treated with respect, and our partner doesn't share it, that, that's, that's just, it's not, it wasn't gonna work. We were very fortunate in being able to unwind that deal and then launch Riot Europe. We had exactly 53 days between the moment we handshaked and the moment they were gonna stop servicing the game to find a data center, set up an entity, hire people, catch up localization, build up a website, setting up the whole thing. And 53 days later, over a weekend, we transferred the service. While we were doing the transfer, the volcano went off. Tonight, travelers are stranded in all on six continents. Volcanic ash has caused the worst disruption in air travel since 9-11. So the volcano blows in Iceland, sending soot all across Europe, canceling all the flights, literally two days before I'm supposed to transfer the service. So I had to plan all these alternate flight routes to get hardware in we were flying stuff through Africa and then up around the Middle East to come into Germany from the east. Like, it was, it was insane. So when we took over the service, North America was about 18% bigger than Europe. And within three months, Europe was 9% bigger than North America, and it was growing faster. But after we launched in Europe, we realized we can do a pretty good job by ourselves. This is actually what our players want. They want a direct relationship with Riot. The biggest thing that we did very early was establishing the forums as being a really important conversation and communication that we would have with players and that players would have with each other, actively asking questions, generating content. Season one was the introduction of ranked ladders, competitive play, Prior to that time, the game was all about playing normal games. There was no stat tracking. When Ranked entered the scene, all of a sudden, that's where players who really wanted to test their competitive metal had an opportunity in the game to go play against each other. Let it ride, baby, let it ride! Boom. Season one was our first experiment in esports. They were just sort of like one-off tournaments with a random set of teams that were willing and able to show up. And, um, and often the whole tournament would be played over the course of a day or two. And that meant a lot of back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back games, which was also, in some cases, tedious to watch. And so the season one finals was gonna be our attempt to wrap that loose season all together and crown a winner. And we wanted to do it at DreamHack because DreamHack was the biggest LAN party in the world. DreamHack is this really cool event where they take these old aircraft hangars. There's like 20 or 30,000 kids all playing games. Tables are built out of like pallets and they bring their own equipment and chairs. It's one of the coolest gaming events in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Almea Convention Center at Jönköping, Sweden. We are here for the DreamHack Summer 2011 Championship game. The final's about to go underway. A $100,000 tournament held by League of Legends and Riot Games. 400,000 people tuned in to watch the finals of season one at DreamHack. 
which blew our minds. There it is, first blood, and it looks like it is going to be Jarvin falling down Shushe. It was so interesting to see this untapped, like, just world of potential where the fans were passionate and they were fans of the game, but like now they're also fans of people playing the game. One turret is down. They're going to back off for now. Lena taking a lot of damage from Ash. 300, 300, 300 damage. That is one turret dead, second turret dead. Oh Fnatic my. going to win the season one championship. Congratulations to Fnatic winning the season one. GG. GG and D. When Fnatic won, People were super happy to see these players that have a career being birthed. When did you know that you had won? A moment ago when their Nexus exploded. <laughs> what are you guys gonna do with your hard-earned cash? I wanna like throw a big party for all my friends at home. It was a clear indicator that the level of interest within our community around esports was really high. I don't think that's ever felt like the norm. At the same time, we were keenly aware of what was going on in Korea. By the mid-2000s, digital stadiums were built in Korea for playing StarCraft. Full-size stadiums full of people screaming. StarCraft is a game where you are not on the field. You're playing like the coach of a football game. You're directing X's and O's. But one of the things about League is that it has an easier entry ramp. It's easier to pay attention to the antics of one unit and one unit and one unit instead of a battlefield with 10,000 units. It's hard to follow the action if you're not trained. When we look at early esports, part of the reason that they took off in Korea is because Korea is a small country that is dense. And so it was wired with high-speed internet far higher speed internet than we have in the United States. Because the population is dense, the idea that people could just go downstairs to the local internet cafes, that was a thing. PC gamers view Korea as sort of the, the mecca of PC gaming, where PC gaming is mainstream and where everybody gets it. You know, you can have an airliner that's painted with StarCraft II logo, and that's okay, and it makes sense. That's just a phenomenally cool place to be as a gamer. The competition in Korea is extremely severe. I would say the most severe in the entire world if you look at just online games alone. There are two to 400 new games that are published each year. On top of the two to 400 games that are already actively being operated in the market, they also play pretty much only online PC games, and they are almost all free to play. So when we go to Korea, the novelty of League of Legends in the West, which is that it's free to play online PC game, that's non-existent in Korea. Everybody has that. So what else you got? League of Legends 현장에서 울려 퍼진 김선 화이팅! 이분들 힘내공이 보통이 아니란다. I just want to say hi to all the League of Legends fans out there in Korea. We're getting ready to provide a phenomenal quality of service and bring the game here to Korea. 한국에서 그냥 성공하기 위한 잘 정착하기 위한 립 서비스로만 생각을 했는데 그게 아니었고 정말 진정성이 있었다라는 부분이죠. 플레이어들도 한국 플레이어들도 그 라이엇 게임스의 진정성에 대해서 굉장히 많이 느끼게 되고 리그 오브 레전드의 장르는 바로 AOS. The newest game on the top 10 list in Korea before we launched was like three and a half, four years old. So very few of these games ever crack the top 10. Most go up and then go into obscurity very, very quickly. So we finally launched. And on day six, we break it into top 10. And we were looking at ourselves thinking, holy cow, did this really happened. And then next thing we know, after three months, it's the number one game in Korea. To the Korean gamers, it was very different. It had qualities of competition, qualities of strategy, qualities of speed, and so many components that a lot of our gamers really truly enjoy. I think there's cultural universals. People want social competition. As the game grows, it creates this positive feedback loop where more and more people know about it, which means more and more people want to know 
how to play it so that they can compete. There has to be something about the game that continues to be rewarding. For League of Legends, that's mastery, the pursuit of mastery, knowing that I'm getting better, spending effort to pursue getting better, feeling rewarded when I have gotten better. Those are experiences that are appealing regardless of what culture you're in. Tetris resonated across all the cultures in the world. So it got that part, but it wasn't sport-like. The biggest thing that makes a sport is spectators. League of Legends is what's gotten me into esports. There are people cheering out there and, and really rooting for these pro teams, and League of Legends has really just come a long way in a short amount of time. I wanted to watch the LCS, uh, the finals, so bad because I, it was really something cool to me. After the season one finals, I think everybody at Riot was buzzing from the reaction from the players and really started to challenge ourselves to think about, okay, what does esports look like for Riot and for League of Legends? We knew it was gonna be a big undertaking. We had no roadmap. We had a really small focused team, but it wasn't a team that had much prior knowledge and broadcast. How do we officially get, so are you gonna be kicking us off here? Like, you, have, you have the chat prompts. So if you wanna tell them to start, uh, I don't have chat right here. When you think of NFL, you think of Sunday football. You think of marquee matchups on Monday night. And esports didn't really have that. It was these intermittent quarterly tournaments that had no real rhyme or reason on timing. It was, when's the venue gonna be available? As a player, I had watched League of Legends esports since the season one competitions at DreamHack. And at the time, my impression of, of League of Legends tournaments, honestly, is that they were very unreliable. Why are you yelling at me? <laughs> yes, we're live. Stop yelling at me. Yeah. Freaking A. This is just not worthy of a fan's time. We knew at that point we wanted to create a formal league. We built out what we thought the LCS could be. We knew it needed a consistent schedule of events, a weekly regular season with the playoffs, with a world final event. You're a little fuzzy. Are you using wireless? I am using wireless. Do you want me to plug it in? Or? Uh, if you could, that would be neat. Yeah. yeah, hold on. I remember meeting Waylon. And I told him, like, I am really worried about what you guys are doing here. There are all these tournaments, and you're going to start to formalize it all into this. And are people going to tune in every single week to watch this? If you're talking about, like, scrapping the whole thing and going, yeah, this esports thing, I don't know so much about it. We're, we're strongly committed to esports at Riot. So this is, this is a thing, and it's going to be around. Esports enhances the experience of being a player. You have something to aspire to, players enjoy watching the game. That's really the perspective that we take that makes the most sense for sort of justifying the investment. But we definitely like don't have that crystal ball. We're gonna sort of learn as we go. When Riot came out and announced the huge things that they were gonna do in esports, everyone was really, really skeptical. Right. We're thinking this was too big, too much, too fast. It was gonna be a disaster, it was going to fail. We really laid the foundation for what would eventually become the LCS. But first, we actually had to get through the end of season two and ensuring that we ended strongly with a good world championship. Season two world championship was by far the biggest esports event Riot had ever put on. It's gonna be really amazing. The big thing here is World Elite has yet to be seen in the previous two days of this tournament. We've been having this remarkable tournament and it's this really cool setting that was in sort of the courtyard between the Staples Center and the Nokia Center. League of Legends, number one. We're in the middle of WE, top team from China, against CLG, top team from EU. We're at CLG, we're like a dark horse coming into the World Finals. We were doing pretty well throughout the year, but no one expected us to really like, get through to the top. And we're going into the group stages against World Elite, one of the big Chinese teams at the time. Only one quarterfinal matchup remains before two epic semifinal showdowns to determine who will play for the right to call themselves the Season 2 World Champions. Ladies and gentlemen, the final day of the Season 2 World Playoffs begins now. That was kind of the peak of esport popularity at that point. Stakes were as high as they've ever been for League of Legends esports. And we just, we just fell on our face. The season two group stages went from being like one of the best days, frankly, ever, to 
to one of the worst. Everything was going great, amazing team fight, the game was about to be decided, and all of a sudden, the internet goes out. One second down, I think it was Crepe that got dropped. Chow May's Guardian Angels does get dropped. Oh my god, no. I do not believe what has happened. You get this little blurb on your screen, attempting to reconnect. That's bad. Just saw attempting to, to reconnect, and teams lagged out, players lagged out, and, and everyone's kind of up in arms, like, what the heck just happened there? 59 minutes, 30 seconds gone, ladies and gentlemen. What the hell? Normally, like, if there is a pause or a lag issue, we can kind of fix it at the time, and our, our guys are just, like, nodding their heads, like, I don't think we're going to get this back. So we cannot unpause it and recreate where it left off. And so all the progress into this game is lost. The game was pretty close at the time, so they decided to do another one. Ladies and gentlemen, there you can see it on your screen. We are into the game. Let's hope for the last time in the quarterfinals, because I don't think anyone here will be able to handle another remake. And it happened again and again. It clearly is adding up the amount of cheers they've had. Oh my god. I don't know what this means. I really don't. Like, are we gonna remake again? Of course they are. We might. Well, what else are they gonna it do? It could happen. It's... Imagine you're in any pro sporting game and you have to just start over after you're sweating and you're out there for 30 minutes. That's what happened. Well, a typical League of Legends game should go on for about maybe 35 minutes to 45 minutes, an hour at most. We played this one game in the group stages for seven hours. No matter how long League of Legends esports goes, if it grows on for 10 years and becomes bigger than the Super Bowl, all those things, everyone who was here will be like, Remember when they had a seven hour best of three and <laughs> everyone will know what they're talking about. And we're sitting on stage saying, right, is this game gonna happen? Where's the competitive integrity? Where's all this other stuff? These teams were playing, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do about it? Eventually we just, we decided, you know what, we gotta pull the plug. We have to send our audience home without having finished the group stages, even though they purchased tickets. We were so disappointed in ourselves. Like we were, we had just, we had built up this huge event and we had just like let everyone down. It was the biggest tournament. It was a high profile failure. That's something that could totally alter the course of Riot Esports. First step was letting our fans know and Brandon bit the bullet on that one. And he's like, you know what, I'm gonna go out there and, and talk to everyone. We kills us to have to deliver this news because you guys have been so unbelievably patient with us. But let me explain exactly what's going on. We, we've been having a myriad of internet connectivity issues. Given what these players have been through so far today, we think the possibility of another restart on a game would just be unfair to them. We recognize the sacrifice that you guys have made being patient with us today. I want to talk about what we're going to do for you guys, the live audience. Uh, we're going to be yeah. refunding your tickets. I'm sure you don't care about that, but we're going to be refunding your tickets. We're going to be giving you guys $25 in riot points. Yeah. We also have a merchandise store full of stuff, and we want to give that to you guys too for free. At that point, we opened up the merch store. We said, everybody can get, you know, merch for free. We ordered pizza for all the people who were staying there. I want to just one more time. We're so sorry about this. Literally, we've been scrambling like crazy. It sucks. We've been having so much fun. And they start to chant, riot. They were actually remarkably understanding at the end. That felt amazing. Our ops team built an offline server. They ripped a server out of our data center and made it so that the internet could no longer mess with our tournaments. And then that kind of fueled us into Galen Center, which was a couple days later for the live event for the finals. Rivington III here coming to you live from USC's Galen Center in Los Angeles. Guys, let's take a moment to go behind the scenes and just see what's going into the production of the World Finals. Right now, the Grand Final stage in the process of being built in preparation for the League of Legends Season 2 World Finals. TPA was in the driver's seat. 
Toys was on Oriana yet again, and his shockwave into Stanley's taunt gave them complete control, locking up two members of Azubu, leading to a Baron. Not playing like the underdog any longer, the Taipei Assassins push their way to the Nexus, defeating Azubu Frost to become the Season 2 World Champions. Against all odds, they take home one million dollars, the Summoner's Cup, and the right to be called Champions of the World. Our own naivete was actually an advantage in those early years. We never really felt like it was going to be real, like more than just sort of like a dream, but players were just showing up in mass and filling all the seats and it felt justified. It, it didn't feel like we were being extravagant or crazy. It felt like we can, we can do this. And then the question became, well, how the heck do we pull it off? Like, how do we broadcast this? I was the guy that had the broadcast experience and I'd worked at NBC and had worked on sports. Uh, before esports. There were a lot of aspects of broadcast sports that we were able to bring into this new frontier where there were these young people who were so passionate about playing this game. It was like opening up a new world for them that added some of that drama of live TV. We were trying to find the right blend of sport, game, and kind of show. We have to stay true to League of Legends. There is some sort of ceremonial game show almost aspect to it. We're going to ask some of our fans if they could marry a champion, who would it be? Uh, I'd marry Leona. I love the Teemo. I would marry Teemo because of the hat. In season three, we had to grow our talent pool, our on-air personality pool, before we could even host an analyst desk. And that's something we wanted to do from the get-go because we're big football fans and we know that it's not just about watching the game, it's about watching the analysis. Actually, he's in the worst shape of all. He's down to half health and he's gonna get dropped by Sabalik to Vladimir right here. With professional esports players, when they started even playing League of Legends, esports didn't exist for them. They've just suddenly gotten you know, dragged and dropped into this world of stardom and fandom. When I first decided to pursue this. My dad definitely thought it was a bad idea. I was playing from Scotland. There's this stigma that's attached with gaming in general, which is when your mom's basically on your case all the time saying, get off the computer, go do something productive. There was an educating process with my parents in regards to, you know, this is a, this can be a big deal. Good job, baby, double kill, get that top tower! We overestimated the pro player ability to like actually engage with the crowd. Because again, these are 17, 18, 19 year old kids who aren't used to being stars. I had to start doing interviews and dealing with fans. I definitely was not good at that. I've really always been scared of like public speaking and being on stage and all of that kind of thing. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Freak here with Lemon Nation and Balls from the Victorious Quantic Gaming. You guys didn't make it through groups. How do you feel when you're like a favorite and you like, what does that do to you? Uh, it was very depressing. We were joking about suicide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I've, I've always been too awkward, I guess, you know? <laughs> Sometimes they don't understand the importance of, you know, giving a good interview and doing all these promotional activities. They don't realize that what they're signing up for is not just playing this game at a professional level, but it's being this kind of celebrity player. You have this huge amount of influence and eyes on you all the time. It's keeping sponsors happy and keeping your fans engaged. And a lot of it is growing up, you know, very quickly. It sounds like a really easy job. Like, you play video games for a living. That sounds great. Like, my kid would love to do that. It's not that easy. It puts an immense amount of pressure on you as a player. There's no respite. There's no hiding. You're constantly online. And if I'm not online, I'm missing out. If I practice football for eight hours in a day, I am completely exhausted. I have no more energy left. I go home and I rest and I come back the next day. Esports doesn't have that physical limitation. We can be playing anywhere between 10 to 14 hours a day, and that's just playing. That's not necessarily the thinking. I go to bed and I'm thinking about the game. If you can play for 12, 13 hours, you should. But that takes a toll on you. It's like a hammer, you know, on your head. Boom every day. Mm -hmm. 
boom, 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 boom. It Example. looks like Dyrus is down for the count already. <laughs> that is classic <laughs> Dyrus right there. This guy gonna have to be careful keeping an eye on what goes on down. When I was a player, I knew the risks, but I felt my, like, like I was a gladiator, you know, in an arena, and I had to entertain the people. They could look to finish it. Do they see Robert? Good esports games are all about moments. League of Legends has these peaks and valleys. When the jungler is coming up through the river, the suspense starts to build as he goes in for a gank. And the crowd in anticipation is like, oh, what's gonna happen? The Xpeke backdoor play is probably one, if not the most famous play of all time. It's time for the last League of Legends game of the day, and it's a big one, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Fnatic Raycon. Xpeke is playing for Fnatic. He's going up against Ocelot and SK Gaming. Okay, you have something to say to your rivals? Have fun. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Xpeke uses teleport to sneak into the opponent's base. What's going on? He instantly teleports straight up onto the. He only needs to get one more shot on him, and he'll be dead. And SK would have won. And he's able to keep rift walking around the Nexus for several seconds while he's evading the other defense coming in. The Nexus down. Is anyone going to deal with this one? Catches him with another axe. He's very low. And he's able to take down the Nexus. Xpeke and Fnatic were just in utter disbelief. Ocelot and SK, they were very, very upset. This is the ultimate drama with so much on the line. This really does feel a lot like sports. We are just destroyed right now as a team. <laughs> and uh, we failed, and we failed. I'm not gonna lie, even today I'm a bit salty about that one. Um, <laughs> it was a good play, especially in that context. Great tournament, important game. As bad as that moment was, when it comes into competition, you always need competitors that you want to destroy. As a professional gamer, there's no balance. You, you just can't afford to have a social life. But then you have to realize why we all do it. Like, we love the competition. We love saying we're the best. We love kicking someone else's ass. That's what we all strive for. We strive to prove ourselves on a world stage. Mark and I grew up in LA, and Staples is the home of the Lakers. So being here today is just, I don't know how to describe it, it's just really sentimental. Welcome to the Season 3 World Championship Final! Coming to you live from the Staples Center here in Los Angeles, California. And we've got the double boxes and double redundancies. We have two servers, we have an internet backup, we have power, backup power. It's the spot where we will bring you guys all the analysis, the highlights, and the predictions for tonight's final, starting with our extended pre-game coverage. Yeah, good luck. Crush it. See you guys. By bringing up the players on a lift and using technology to sort of elevate this new type of sport, for us, that felt like another step forward. League is such an international game, and the international leagues are so popular, and we knew we wanted to take it on the road. Korea was the obvious choice. This Seoul World Cup is a very important place in the world. In that place, it can be able to do e-sports. It can be able to get 4 million people in the world. It can be a huge news. 40,000 people? the hell, 40,000 people. The opening ceremony will begin shortly with traditional Korean music, followed by a live performance from Imagine Dragons playing their hit song, Warriors. This <laughs> Uh, 
정말 인정받는 스포츠라고 말하기는 어려울 것 같아요. Hello Berlin, we get this deal. Ladies and gentlemen, are you guys ready for the 2015 League of Legends World Championship? You have players like Baker, who I guess if there is a Michael Jordan of League of Legends or esports, this is the guy. I think almost universally considered the best player. Baker has remained dominant for years now. He's just that good. I have so much to tell you, but my English is not good. So thank you and thank you for joining and always love me. It feels like we're returning to our roots, but with way better production values and capabilities to actually deliver a show like this. We used projection on the floor to demonstrate how the field position would work on the rift. You could feel as the stakes rose, the intensity of the fans and of the players and the entire vibe of the event. SK Telecom have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. The SKT reign continues. They win their third world championship. Truly a legend. Baker became such a big player because he could do all these mechanically advanced moves, always hitting everything at the right second. That's where idols come in. That's where you start wanting to be like somebody. Today's games were absolutely awesome. I lost my voice because I was screaming too loud. It was the best experience where I've ever had for League. Because they have spent virtually zero dollars on traditional marketing, League of Legends has kind of flown underneath the radar by the mainstream. Suddenly when all these stories started popping up about esports and these tournaments and wow, the Staples Center was sold out for this massive event, you naturally had a lot of derision from traditional media. It's a pastime some think is symbolic of slackers, of teenagers killing time. But video gaming is now a professional sport. You could call it the Super Bowl of video gaming. It's the biggest competitive event we've never heard of. League of Legends. League of Legends. League of Legends. League of Legends. What is League of Legends? League of Legends is the most played like game ever. The most the most played downloaded how, how game. They, oh, because it's an it's an internet game? I had zero knowledge of the fact that this exists. You didn't know there were cyber athletes? My hand to God, I didn't know there were cyber <laughs> and men, But my issue is it's still not a sport. Well, again, it's a it's... game. Have you guys seen eSports and the E-League? I don't know if that's sports. Do you have any statistics on how many of those people also go to Star Trek conventions? <laughs> I find it very bizarre. I feel like it's really, this is the sign of the apocalypse that people are actually into this sort I... of thing. I don't feel that way. I'm kind of like, excited about this. I can understand people watching a golf game. No. <laughs> I can't understand people watching somebody play a computer game. Well, I have to say, my wife can't understand people watching a golf game because she's not a golfer. So if, if you're not a gamer, that's not going to appeal to you. For a lot of the older folks, they're like, amazed by it. Of They're like, course. how could people watch other people playing a game? The flip side is we watch other people playing a game all the time. Games like yeah. basketball, football, etc. Throw home, won't go. I like sitting down and watching League of Legends games. Like I, I don't normally watch sports either, <laughs> which is funny because I played a lot of sports. Chris Louie is perfect. And yeah, Chris's right footed punt, very high random. You have five guys working together on a team and if they don't work together, then the other team's going to beat them. And I mean, that, that's what a team sport is. You have traditional sports athletes like Rick Fox enter the space with his own team. They are digital athletes. They're professional digital <laughs> athletes. Like them wrestlers. Well, no, look, when you think about, look, I think about what it took for me to become a professional athlete. It took a lot of, a lot of concentration, a lot of dedication, practice, preparation, stamina. They're sponsored. They have careers. They make hundreds of thousands of dollars. The average salary for a player is close to $300,000 a year. 
There's rumors like Faker turned down multi-million dollar salaries in China. Players are now even eligible for US P1 visas, normally reserved for touring athletes. What is a P1A visa? A P1A visa is a visa that's given for athletes, which means that you are an exceptional athlete from another country coming into the United States and you have to prove that your athletic capabilities are good enough to guarantee you living inside the United States. The world, is this the equivalent of the Super Bowl in my mm. world? Yeah, I would say so, except the only difference would be if the Super Bowl is just the US, this is like there's 13 countries that play this game and they all come together for the world championship. The best Korean team comes to the States to play. The best, you know, North American team, the best team in China has come to play. It's the best team trained together for a whole year, right? That's the difference. So you're getting the games at the highest level. Quadra kill from Fnatic. Quadra kill from Fnatic. The feeling in there is exactly the same as being on an NFL field. <laughs> like it's, you have fans cheering, you have you know big plays developing, you have moments of glory and moments of defeat. Eli throwing into traffic on the side. It'll be really interesting to see if the sustainability is there and whether we can take league and build it into what can be generationally relevant. The way that we identify with teams, be it if we're a Red Sox fan and we were long suffering until the 2000s. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. We want to see that type of generational rich fabric of fandom that goes beyond year to year. That's the goal, to have esports become sports that last. The growth around League of Legends and the growth around esports has been tightly coupled with accessibility of the content. Live streaming, Twitch, and YouTube, and Facebook, all these places you can watch this content. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Greatest League Talk Show. I am your host, Skara. Streaming has become such a generational thing. Some people don't want to watch sports, or they don't want to watch like TV, but they want to watch gaming. You just slow roll and wait for people to slowly smash your face in. They're gamers and in their free time, they want to watch what they love. All the top streamers are usually old professional players. They're kind of going to have to start fights off of Skara. If you can land really, really good ults, he'll just make things happen. Well, I ended up being like one of the first ever educational streamers. I'm able to catch a little bit. I would bit talk about what I'm doing. Now that sounds crazy, right? Super easy, but is it? Ideally, you don't want to get in range to queue of where it looks. Think about you narrating your life and every aspect of your life every day. That's what I would do in games. 100 and f Oh my god. I have a subscriber base where they pay a certain amount every month to support me. They can support me through donations and they can support me just by watching because I make money through ad revenue as well. I am currently making six figures right now. I will eventually be a millionaire. Oh my god, what a game. Infernal! Sorry. I was exposed to Twitch via my uh, online friends, and I started watching these streamers, and I got hooked on it. And I'd watch them, I'd be like, wow, I love what they do, I wish I could do that someday. Oh, give me the penta, dude! As a streamer, I'm here to entertain, I want to make people laugh, smile, and I want to enjoy what I do. Yes! Yes, all three CS. I did a lot of stuff like student council in high school, as part of clubs, dance team, soccer team, stuff like that. I really love making friends, and I remember hitting triple digits, 100 people watching, and I thought that was like the biggest deal ever. Nowadays, I average like five to 10,000 people watching me. People come up to you and they say like, I watch your stream and you really helped me through a tough time where um, I lost a parent or I lost a friend. Thanks, Chingus Cream. Welcome to the Pokey Squad. Appreciate ya. You Thank really you. help people stay happy and feel company just by streaming. So I'm gonna play with a bunch of my viewers right now. We're all just loading into a game. I love human interaction. And there's just no better way to interact digitally with anyone than with live streaming, period. Ocelot was a streamer back in the early days of League of Legends. There's comic timing to everything, even anger. And if you're charismatic and funny about being angry and furious, that can go a long way. 
It was kind of one of the first streams that banked on being entertainingly toxic. When you're immature, um, when you haven't lived through a lot of ups and downs in life, then you get thrown a bad teammate in a bad moment in front of a few thousand people watching you. And then that amount of pressure, peer pressure, and it just everything comes too fast. And you just feel very frustrated about the situation and you say things that you don't even feel yourself, you know? Drop a mind to win this matchup. In the case of Ocelot, he would say terrible things to insult people, whether it's your opponent and you're just trash talking them, or it's your own teammate on your team that has not performed up to your standards. Riot had to get involved and say, if you're going to be a professional athlete representing not only League of Legends, but Riot Games playing in this league, you're going to need to clean it up. Of course, there is no ill intent, and I'm a kid. I remember it was about the time that my father actually was going through chemotherapy. But reacting that badly, especially in front of people, is the worst thing you can do, you know, because these kids look up to you. And showing them that kind of bad side of competition is the worst thing you can do. I remember the community and Riot being extremely fair, being judgmental, uh, which helped me also be self-reflective. Uh, but at the same time, being empathetic and giving me a second chance, which they did. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. I love you all. Bye. While there's one case of Ocelot, there are a hundred cases of players who have not reformed, who have not cut out the, the toxicity. The internet has this amazing power to create crowds, and crowds create anonymity. Because it's free to play, you can get people coming into the game from anywhere, and you can have people having almost zero accountability for their actions there. League of Legends has a really bad reputation for being toxic. Because you're in a high pressure situation, there are a lot of factors outside of your control. I can see why people get frustrated, and I can see why in today's online culture that frustration turns into something pretty ugly. No fucking joke, I'm not kidding. Kill yourself. It's very similar to what you see in Road Rage, for example. It leads to that flash in a pan rage where we tend to act out. The part that I find very painful just as a gamer is that my crime is that I show up as a woman. I don't play on voice chat because you're gonna figure out pretty quickly that I'm not of the male persuasion, and so that usually leads to you know, a variety of your classic get back to the kitchen comments to nasty stuff that I'm totally not gonna repeat here. I don't think it's a League of Legends specific problem. I think it's a gaming problem. For a lot of us, it's become white noise. If we got legitimately upset, we would never play. You almost have to learn a bit about human psychology and realize that this person must be in such a terrible place to be doing that kind of thing. I almost feel bad for them in that sense. Although you can get a lot of hate, I try to focus more on how to fix the situation as opposed to being mad at it. Early league started out small enough that many of these problems didn't manifest. Then it grew. At some point, League said, we need to take this seriously. We need to engage in the process of governance. Welcome to the Tribunal. The Tribunal allows you to shape player behavior for the better, acting directly on reports from fellow players. We built a, a penalty system for that, and we even experimented with trying to pull the community in and have them be the arbiters of what deserved a penalty or what didn't. After reviewing the chat log, I decide I want to punish him. But if we jump in there and we're like, you know, you can't do that and that's terrible and all of these different things, then what happens is we just collectively, as people dig our heels in, we're like, oh, this is change. Whoa, what's, what's happening? And that's what led us to say, let's figure out what this gap is. And it turned out it was encouragement. It was telling folks when they're doing a great job that they're doing a great job. Instead of it always being about the punishments, let's celebrate with players. And that has worked so much better than just strictly focusing on those, those penalties. But we're never gonna reach perfect. There is no perfect. There's no end state. There's just this ongoing understanding of players.
even though people might say that the community is toxic, I feel like we can make it a better place by being support talkers rather than trash talkers. Toxicity is negative. Let's not keep that up. We're all about good times. I'm here to say that there is a whole side that never gets talked about full of awesome people who are being really good to each other. So keep playing League. League of Legends is part of a very big movement. It's the players and fans that are all coming together to craft this experience together. League of League of League of it's not just a bunch of people independently consuming something. It is a ton of people all over the world creating something. For them, it's about the characters themselves. It's this character-driven situation where you kind of assume the fantasy of this game. The huge cast of characters that has developed is one of the reasons why League can have that popularity. It gives that access. We're generally looking for something that we identify with. And that means that anybody can come to that and find a way in. I thought the art of the characters was so cool. This looks really fun and interesting, and I really like it. Heimerdinger does have the best swag walk. Oh, Dude. yeah, yes, that swag. Heimerdinger oh, swag. swag. Order, entropy, a never ending cycle. Oh my god, I love Graves. They made that Graves skin with like no shirt, and I was like, mm. Feeling lucky? Try me. I connect with this so much that I am Draven. <laughs> my favorite character by far is Timo. He is an underdog. He's a little guy. He's not strong. He's very fast, and he can't really fight you straight up one-on-one. -on -one. I like him because he's super relatable to basically anyone. Armed and ready. It doesn't matter if you're from China or Korea or USA. You see this guy, and you're like, I know what that character is all about. The characters have such vibrant backgrounds and personality to them. And that's the reason why, for example, you see so many people cosplaying. It's not just like a generic character. It's their their rich and full of life. I'm a casual player, but I'm I mean Wukong, obviously. <laughs> yeah, he's a fun character to play. You do not want to mess with that dude. Seven foot, like un virtually unkillable barbarian warriors coming at you with a sword that can cleave you in two. The designers decided to name him after a character that I had played in EverQuest, which was a barbarian warrior. So they thought that Trinity was a really cool name and just fit the persona. A lot of players, when I'm playing, get disappointed if I'm not playing Trinity Also, they're like, oh, please play Trinity What's the secret to League of Legends? It's this right here, it's the community. So it's look around, just do a 360. That's well the secret. That's literally. <laughs> it's hard for me because my parents don't really understand like all this stuff. You know, I played with these guys for like a year now, if not longer, and it's just like I, I see talk to these guys every single day. And for me to actually come and finally meet them, it's so cool. And when we're playing online, it's nice to come on and just have family or a community that understands that. In games, there's no borders that typically exist. Like, when I meet someone online, I'm meeting them at face value. I don't know nothing about them. I can't see them. I don't know what race they are. I don't know what their socioeconomic background is. I don't know if they're important or not. Like, it doesn't matter. Where are you guys from? North Dakota. Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. Heavy. Anchorage. Alaska. Nah. Pittsburgh. Chicago. Chicago. Vancouver. League of Legends becomes all of this, this universal language in and of itself. Like, I can be in Shanghai and see somebody with a Teemo hat, and instantaneously we have this bond and can talk about, oh, Teemo, and, you know, have smiles and laughs. It was just a hugely cool thing to see the passion that players would have for League of Legends, you know, in all these different parts of the world. Publishers like to think of markets as just completely different internationally. But I think gamers around the world have an awful lot in common that, that people don't necessarily recognize or appreciate. As huge and crazy as it is, they've only managed to make this one game. And while they certainly admitted that there are more games in the pipeline, how much pressure must there be on you if you're working on one of those projects 
to follow up something like a League of Legends. You know, is League of Legends the best game Riot will ever make? Is it the biggest game they will ever make? I don't know, but there's a chance it could be. Ever since League of Legends really kicked off and became just sort of a phenomenon, everyone's sort of waiting to see when it will die. Every game dies. StarCraft was the eSport for a long time and it faded away. I don't think a game can last forever. I think eventually another game will overlap it as, you know, like the biggest eSport. I think that's just the nature of eSports. There are more eSports titles out there. There are more games taking up mindshare. It's a little bit of an arms race of who's going to be doing it best, who's going to invest more people and more resources into eSports and competition. We're in a make or break time for eSports, right? Like this thing needs to continue to grow at the rate that it's projected to grow. People talk about it by 2020, it's gonna be a $1.5 billion business every year. All these investors have come in buying the hype, buying the speculation, where this thing is going. If it doesn't go that way, this whole ecosystem is at risk of collapsing. We wanted to go to China and set up a show in the bird's nest, the home of the Olympics. That presents a lot of risk and, and it's scary. This is the exact track in which Usain Bolt broke his own 100 meter record. The first Most sports have 100 years of history. We have under 10. We know that we need to develop deeper bonds with potential partners and sponsors, and we are incredibly motivated. So much of it has been about Faker, as it always is, but this year, when they've needed him most, he has played better than ever before. We wanted to create memories with these big events, and we know that those memories are what carry on. When people look back, they think of these kind of flashbulb moments. Those are the things that you can't really value because it was a moment that all of us will remember forever. The upset is complete as the kills come through. The SKT dynasty is over. All hail the new kings, Samsung Galaxy, your 2017 world champions. Every single player talked about revenge against SKT. They got it, Faker is destroyed. Once a phenomenon like League of Legends happens, you can't undo the effect it's had. It may evolve, it may change, but it doesn't just disappear. The impact, I think, has barely begun to be felt. It might even be a generation before we truly see it. Our parents always kind of thought that we would stop playing these games. Uh, and I think we're just starting to hit the point where people feel like games are here to stay. Almost everybody can be considered a gamer, whether it be Candy Crush on your phone or whether you scrim League eight hours every day. You know, everybody can enjoy some type of game. League of Legends is a lifestyle. I think the only thing my parents want is me to find a girlfriend, and that's it. <laughs> my parents are just like, you gotta pursue a love life. And I'm just like, I'm busy playing League. How, how do I do that? I came out on uh, League of Legends with my boyfriend. I play League of Legends because my friends forced me to. Well, we ended up building a really strong relationship through League of Legends, strong enough that he decided to make me his best man at his wedding. League of Legends isn't done. It hasn't reached its full potential. We're not perfect and we don't get it all right, but I mean, I just think it's such a privilege to help make the types of games that I most love to experience. We realize that it's not about us. It's about our audience that we're trying to serve. You're no longer you know, who you were. You are now part of something greater. Everything that we do is made possible by the community their level of engagement, their level of support. The community is the game. Nice job, guys. <laughs> GG. <laughs>